Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Remko Rinkema, and I am joined today by my friend, uh, former co-worker, poker pro, uh, one of the w one of the people in the industry that I have like a lot of cool memories with, Christy Arnett. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate you being with me. We are watching High Stakes Poker Season 6, throwing it, throwing it back to the old school stuff. Um, we have a lot of interesting poker action to dive into, but first and foremost, how are you holding up? Oh my goodness. I, you know, it's funny because I, I really, I'm doing so well. And every time someone asks me that, I, I feel sort of guilty. I know there's a lot going on in the world right now, but I'm really happy to be here and watch high stakes poker. This is the show that, I mean, made us all fall in love with poker. The characters, I'm just so excited to watch this with you. And yeah, everything's everything's really good. Awesome. I love it. We'll dive into everything else that you're working on, everything that's going on in your life. We'll dive back into some old memories. There's a photo on the internet of me carrying you upside down after a soccer game. We'll, we Maybe we'll dive into that. Um, and for the people who are watching the show, please uh, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. We'll try to answer as many as possible. And also, if you're new to the show, on this show, you have to listen to our yapping and our talking while you watch High Stakes Poker. If you don't like that, <laughs> go to PokerGo.com right now to watch all seven seasons of High Stakes Poker without the two of us. I mean, if you enjoy that kind of experience, if that's your thing, you know, be my guest. Go over to PokerGo.com, watch High Stakes Poker. If you want to hang out with us for probably 90 minutes, almost two hours, just stay here and watch and hit the like button because that's something that we, we really have to do in order to keep the show going. I appreciate it, you guys. Let me know where you're watching from and all that good stuff. And then we'll dive into season six. For the people who are with me on the show every single week, as I do two shows every week, we watched the entire season five over the last two months. Now we're starting with season six. Catch my drift. We're going to just keep watching season six with our guests on the show as we dive into the fall season. Stay warm, stay hydrated, grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. This is High Stakes Poker, obviously one of my favorite shows. Christy, what I want to start with at the start of High Stakes Poker, season one, of course, we're watching season six. But when this first came out, probably 2006, 2007, where were you at? Was this the thing that triggered you to play poker? Was this sort of like, oh, wow, this is cool. I can watch this now. I'm already playing a lot of poker. Give me, give me sort of the backstory there. So I started playing poker in high school when I graduated, which was 2003. So I'd already been playing poker a few years. And actually, when I turned 21... I moved out to Las Vegas and had zero money, but big dreams. And all I wanted to do was dive into the poker industry, just be around poker. And I landed an internship at Card Player Magazine in 2006. So this is when I started getting to know the pros. I started writing articles. My first feature cover article was with Tom Dwan, who is on this episode. You guys, Tom Dwan was the coolest dude in town during this time. Like he was the man. And I remember my boss, Justin Marchand, he was like, all right, kid, this is your shot. <laughs> He's going to announce the Dwan challenge. And I got to, I got to interview him in the Bahamas. So this is that year he was blowing up. He was challenging people. And he was like, I'm giving odds. Cause I'm so good. Wow. That, that, that's crazy to think back to. I mean, the Dirt Challenge feels like forever ago. Um, I, I first I first joined the poker industry back in 06, which was when the first season of High Stakes Poker came out. But that I mean that was in the Netherlands. I was downloading. Sorry guys, I was downloading illegal torrents to watch the show because it wasn't on TV in Europe. So very complicated for me back in those days. Now we have poker. Was that Go. all you were downloading? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I only watch poker. Come on. <laughs> you know, to deep deep into the night all i would watch is poker chip porn's all we need yeah ex exactly the, the the sound of the chips is is what really got me that was that was my thing um but yeah it, it's cool to think back of those first steps that you made what is it like for a 21 year old to travel from the midwest and live in las vegas and just start a new life well it was pretty tough at first honestly andrew and i who's my husband, we moved out together. He was a, the first poker pro I ever met and fell in love with him. That's how much I love poker. But we moved out together and, you know, back in our hometown, we were like the cool guys. We were playing the biggest stakes in any room. And then we moved to Las Vegas and we started playing one, two, because that was the biggest staked poker in Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> so we're the small fish 
and we had no money. I think we moved out with like one month's rent and we grinded our way up. We played at Red Rock Casino because that was closest to us. And we just played the one, two, trying to hit the like the bad beat jackpot, which was like 500K or something. Never did. <laughs> but but, you know, looking back on those days, being broke, trying to figure it out, it was tough. But I look back at it with nostalgia. You know, we were making friends in poker and trying to figure out how to get by and party. And, you know, it's when you're broke and you have nothing to lose, it's like pretty easy to gamble on life. So, um, yeah, it was it was tough. But I think, you know, any everybody knows every poker player knows that the game teaches you to handle ups and downs. And that's really what it what it did for us. And when it was tough, there were shows like this, like high stakes poker, where we could all watch in the living room with our friends and play along. And this was how we used to learn back then. There wasn't as many online training sites. We would just watch Tom Dwan and Phil Ivey with his beady eyes and just think to ourselves, like, what was he thinking? How did he know? That's how we learned. I mean, this is the perfect moment to jump into the action immediately. Tom Don makes it 3,100. Dario Minieri makes it 10,600 with the King-10 offsuit. This is the, this is the quintessential high-stakes poker hand. Two aggressive guys, not backing down, both just ready to fire, put all the money in the middle. I believe everyone started with 200K in this session. Um, I do think they're kicking up the action later in the season, though, to 501K with half a million buy-in. But right now, 200K buy-in, so that's how deep they are. I believe they're playing uh, 400, 800. So we got Dwan and Minieri uh, face to face here in this situation. Of course, he's always C betting. You know that's that was a thing of the past. You always continuation bet. Let's see. Let's see if Dwan gets creative here. Continuation, making Dwan late, keeping him waiting. The good news is whoever loses 200,000 in this hand, this is that's the gist of it. It's gonna have it. Two minute interview afterwards yeah. to tell what they thought, what they were thinking. Here we go. Of Dwan course, calls, not backing down. He likes the jack of hearts, not in love with it. <laughs> Man, Dario Minieri. I, th I think Dar Dario Minieri was among the unluckiest players on high stakes poker. He he didn't win a hand, I believe. Like he, he was just getting crushed by everyone. Dwan checks his flush. All I remember Dario during that time was Dario Minieri bought a Porsche with Poker Stars points, right? He did, yeah. I believe it was four, three million or five million FPPs, and he was the first one to do it. He got Supernova Elite grinding heads up sit and goes, and I think Elki did the same thing back when they first did that. I, I want to say it was back in 07 or 06 when Supernova Elite first became a thing. But yeah. So so Dario gave up this hand, right? He just checked, check. check. Check the turn, check the river when yeah. the heart came. Yeah, he did. He gave up, and Dwan was hoping for a little action there on the river, as always. And and also keep in mind, Tom Dwan always has it. Like Tom Dwan is is also the biggest bluffer, but he also always has it. As we saw last week on the show, Tom Dwan bluffs his way to you know a set, and then he just gets all the money, which is the way to do it. Or sorry, it was Jack Ten. He made run runner full house against. Alan Meltzer on the final episode. Um, for the people in the chat who are asking, is High Stakes Poker coming back? Yes, indeed. Season 8 is coming. Announcement is going to be soon. We are working on the lineups. It's going to be at the Poker Go studio, and it's going to be fantastic. That's all I can say. So whenever we have more information, we'll make Woo! sure to share that's it with so you That's exciting. Guys. Yeah, I know. It's going to be really exciting. Make sure to follow Poker Go on Twitter. That's, that's the spot where we'll have the announcement. So if you're into this kind of action, go check us out on Twitter. Give us a follow button. And of course, I will... I will break down the lineups on this show, but the first announcement will be on Twitter. So don't miss out on that. Um, if you guys have questions for Christy, please send them into the chat. If you have any questions about anything poker related, we'll try to tackle those. I already see tons of shout outs from people from all different countries. We have Mexico and Costa Rica in the house. Love to see it. A um, lot, lot, of, lot of Spanish speakers today in the show. on the show. I really love seeing that. Let me see if we missed any questions already. Um, love seeing some of the familiar faces back in the day. Nicholas says, I still continuation bet there. Um, yeah, but I, it's, it's more of a joke where back in the day, the back in the day, flush draws were the nuts and continuation betting was the standard move. Um, to Christy, back to your play, back to when you first arrived in Vegas. I'm curious, what were some of the highs and lows you remember from that first year? Were there specific things that stand out from that experience of moving here? Oh, man. Well, 
The first time that I got to play in one of the bigger tournaments, which at the time were the Venetian Deep Stacks. I remember thinking like, oh, this is how all the guys get to eventually play the 10Ks. And, you know, it's it's crazy that like a $300 tournament seemed like a lot at the time. I asked all my card player friends to buy action. And it was like the first time where I felt like, oh, I'm really, I'm really like a player now. And also, you know, I think during this time that we have together and while we're watching high stakes poker, I think it's worthwhile to really look at those moments where you know poker is changing. And when I started playing deep stacks and started like there would there would be some of the pros dropping in like Eric Baseballdy Baldwin, who was just crushing at the time. And that's like the, that's the beauty of poker that you get to play with pros. You can be an amateur and start playing with them. And I think that there are these moments where you see, you start to see yourself differently as either a poker player um, or when you start becoming a semi pro and then finally a pro. And as I'm watching these like high stakes hands, I remember um, I, I started getting coached by a pro. Like the first time I started getting coached was by Andrew Beluga Whale Sideman, who worked for Deuces, or he coached for Deuces Crack. And like when I started thinking like a pro was when he, I played a hand and he asked me like, why did you do that? Like I, I made a C-bet. C-bet, we'll talk about C-bets. He was like, so why, why, why did you do that? And I was like, oh, well, because, you know, like I was the pre-flop raiser. And he was like, yeah but why? And we were like sitting in my living room and he was like, you want to be a pro? You got to be able to explain why you did what you did. And I was like, oh, and he's like, was it a bet or was it a bluff? Was it for value? Did you think worse hands were calling? And I was like, boom. And the whole room just like caved in on me. I was like, oh, this is why I still have a job. Like I can't explain why I just made a bet. Was it, you know, to get a better hand to fold or a worse hand to call? And that was just a real huge moment. And he started coaching me. And eventually, like a few months after that, I won a mini F tops, a heads, a heads up mini F tops. Um, while I was, while I had just moved into a, a new place and I was thinking like, I wanted to really take my game seriously. And so that was a huge moment. And, and after that, I think things really changed. People started to see me as a player. Uh, they took me more seriously, especially because they had won a heads up event. And yeah, that, that was huge. Like these guys aren't just C betting. They actually have a reason why they're doing what they're doing. Yeah, no, you're spot on. And I think that anyone who's ever had the idea to play poker seriously went through a moment where you realize like, oh my God, I actually suck a lot because yeah. they asked me one question and I have no idea what to say. Um, let's listen to this conversation between Phil Ivey and Tom Dwan. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, 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 hang on a second. Show the eight or the Here's nine. 2K to show anything higher than a pair of jacks. Jacks are higher. Here's 2K. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Show anything higher than a pair of jacks. If you can beat a pair of jacks, it'll give you 2,000. Yeah. That's what he's saying. You're giving me 2,000 yeah. if I can beat a pair of jacks? Jacks are better. Can I just show you? <laughs> can I have to show the table? Yep. <laughs> it's not, not worth it. Huh? Show the 8, 9. I don't mind, no, Phil. I don't, I don't eight, like nine, to show nine. these things. Oh, I my God. Jack. So... He just missed out on a free $2,000. Like his image was more important than the money. His image was more important than the money. That is the way to describe Phil Ivey, I think. <laughs> right? Yes, you're right. Sometimes I'm like, are you allergic to money? Oh my God. I mean, the, the, the quintessential Ivy quote is obviously uh, when he played against Brad Booth, who moves in on him. And Ivy is holding kings and Brad Booth puts like a million dollars in cash out. And Ivy says, man, the cash just looks so sweet. Like that, like that's just Ivy in a nutshell. I mean, it's, God, he's a legend. Give me your Ivy story. Let's just jump right into it. Do you have an interaction with Ivy, a moment with Ivy? I mean, you, you, you probably interviewed him or at least tried to interview him a bunch of times. What, what's, what's the funniest story? 
Man, I have a few Ivy stories. Well, first of all, there is there an Ivy story that doesn't involve me. I think it could it could be a myth, but that back when people started wearing sunglasses, he bought a, apparently a 5K pair of sunglasses like in one of the fancy stores at Bellagio because you know that's what people were doing. And he had the sunglasses on and he misread his hand in a pot and immediately threw the, <laughs> the, the sunglasses, the 5K sunglasses in the garbage. Possible, just myth, sounds like something that Ivy would do. But I have interviewed Ivy a few times. And the one time though, that everybody wanted to interview him was when he made the final table of the World Series of Poker main event. Afterwards, we were all clamoring on the sides, all of us poker reporters like, hey, can we get a quote? Can we get a picture? Can we get anything? Like, <laughs> give us something. But he booked out of there without giving anyone anything. And the next day I was partying with Christina Lindley and she was inviting me to go to the club because at Jet, there was a guy who had finished maybe 12th in the main event celebrating his finish. Gosh, I can't remember his name right now. He had a funny last name. I'll find um, I'll find it while you tell the story. Okay. Uh, he's a sweet guy. 12th, 13th. Anyway, so she invites me to the club. She's like, girl, you know, free bottle. Like, we're all just going to hang out. So I'm like, sure, cool. I'm like, you know, 23. Like, let's do it. Whatever. So... I go to the club, we're partying with, with them at the, at the club, which is right across from the poker room. You've been there, right? Yeah. We've been there. Oh yeah. What's it called? It was jet, right? Or no bank. A ban bank. Yeah. Bank. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Bank. Yeah. Bank. So we're partying and I, a afterwards, I, I wasn't sure where Andrew was. I thought he might be playing poker in the Bellagio poker room. So I like, kind of toddler walk in there because I'm drunk because I just had a bunch of free drinks and I'm in club clothes heels and fueled up with a little bit of liquid courage when I see <laughs> when I see uh Bobby's room is full there's everybody that you could ever want to see Doyle Brunson Tom Dwan basically this this game basically this game, <laughs> this game is happening in Bobby's room for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Except for Dario. Cause he's probably in Italy somewhere. Right. I don't think Daniel was there either. Cause, uh, I feel like I would have remembered, but I was drunk. So, but there's, of course, there's a guy in front who guards the doors because they're behind some really beautiful glass. Cause they're very classy over the Bellagio. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I just decide I'm going to act like I know what I'm doing. And I just walk in there and I'm like, <laughs> Hey guys. And everybody's looking at me. And then I see Phil and he looks at me and I'm like, you didn't give me an interview. <laughs> and this is back when they did November nine. So there was a big thrift, a long three months between the final table. So I'm like, you, you didn't give me an interview. And he's like, uh, wow okay i'll give you an interview and he gives me his phone number and i'm like sure this is like i'm gonna get an interview uh i think he just wanted to shut me up at that point uh because i never got the interview oh no yeah but the full that full story is gonna be in, in oh did you touch 2022 sorry i think you did something with your mic are you back i can't hear you anymore no, you're you're out. <laughs> uh, how about now? Yeah, you're back. You're back. You're back. How about now? Yeah, you're good. Oh, too bad. I just told the end of that crazy oh, story. Oh no, and you're never we, gonna missed know, I we, we missed it. We missed it. We missed it. Just story. kidding. It's gonna be in my book in 2022. Oh, the book. Is there a book? Whoa, hold on. Is there gonna be a Chrissy Ar <laughs> Chrissy Arnett tell all story book coming? Yes, but it's more gonna be about risk and love and stuff. So it's going to be about, you know, Andrew and I, I, I told, I, you know, we've talked a little bit about it, but we, you know, we've been together for 15 years and we've been through a lot 
And there was a point in our relationship where we almost got a divorce. And in order to rebuild, we actually had to lean on everything that poker taught us about risk. So I'm writing that book. Wow. That sounds very, very deep. 2022. Um, that, that's, still, that's still a while away. So you got some time. And I hope the Ivy story somehow makes its way in there. That'd be really funny. Um, I the, think... I think oh. Yeah? Okay, good. Um, I, I have one funny Ivy story where... During the 2014 WSOP, I, j I had just started doing some on-camera stuff because you girls all just went up and left. So there was someone else had to fill in. So I was the fill-in. I was the fill-in for Chris Arnett. So imagine the drop-off in, in both interest from players and also quality of, of, of interviews. Stop it. So, you are extraordinarily talented. But I was also... And handsome. I was extraordinarily nervous and, and not comfortable in front of a camera that first summer. And the funny part was Ivy wins his 10th bracelet in the horse event or he's heads up or something. Donnie Peter sends me a message on Skype. He goes, Ivy is about to win his 10th bracelet. You're the only one here who can be on camera. You're doing the interview if he wins. I was like, okay, I guess it's fine. And I was, <laughs> I was absolutely scared. Shitless. It's fine. I'm fine. It's I'm, fine. I'm totally fine. So anyway, that summer I had been doing these videos called Ivy stories. So I've been asking other people about Phil Ivey, which is a little strange, but it also was really funny and it worked really well. So he does win the tournament. I go over there. It's like the, the, the front corner of the Amazon room. So when you walk in, it's that first corner on the right and it had bleachers set up and there were legit like 200 people wa watching, like just friends, fa friends and fans and all sorts of stuff. So I walk up there, Nolan Dalla hands him the bracelet. And as you know, Ivy always wants to leave, but because he wins a bracelet, Nolan Dalla literally tells him, sit down, we're going to do an interview. So I'm like, I sit down next to Phil Ivy. I had not covered the event. I didn't even know what bracelet he won. So basically, basically <laughs> I look up at the, like, light goes on. I think it was Will Thomas on, on the, behind the camera. The light goes on. I'm saying my intro, not knowing what event he had won. So I look up behind the camera to see the, the, the clock, the tournament clock. And I just read the clock while I'm watching, watching or thinking about what I'm supposed to say. So I save myself. We do the interview. He's classic Ivy. Very short answers. Doesn't seem interested whatsoever. As I'm about to sign off, I'm like, my name is Rem Karinkema. Thank you guys all so much for watching. Stay tuned for much more. He goes, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm like, oh my God, I'm about to die on camera here. So I, I point the microphone at him. He goes, you know those Ivy stories you've been doing? Those stories are not all true. So... He was basically saying, I watch your videos. I know, I know what you're up to. So I, d I died on the inside, but I was like, this is really cool. He, he basically watches my videos. Um, anyway, Phil, I know you're a big fan. That is amazing. <laughs> that, was, that was really funny. It was a really strange moment. Um, and I, I've been doing Ivy stories ever since, and I hope he still watches. And I, I, I'm sure he's a big fan of this show, too. I mean, can't, has to be. Um, anyway. He's probably watching this right now. He's, he's probably watching this right now, and he probably loves watching himself. That's probably, probably it. Um, he also seems extremely tired and annoyed all the time at the table, which is funny. Um, Helmuth, by the way, <laughs> taking a bath so far. That first hand, he made a 55K, and Ivy shoved on him, and he folded the ace-jack offsuit. Um, we'll keep an eye on the big pots and make sure that we don't miss them as, as Ivy is. He seems very frustrated with something, which is really funny. Yeah, he's got his hand in his forehead just flipping chips in with five three, one pair. Uh, you know, what's interesting, I think is true for Ivy is that he, everything he does is, has a purpose, right? Even him in your interview, waiting till the very end and being like, hold on, by the way, this, he has a purpose. Either it's because he wants to have a psychological or emotional edge or, or he wants to, he knows how he looks right here when he's just like, oh, whatever. <laughs> he knows. He might not be able to like, if you asked him about it, he might not articulate it perfectly well, or he might not articulate it perfectly well because he doesn't want to tell you and he's going to act like he can't. So just saying, this guy is calculated. Right, yeah. It there's so much going on in, in that brain of his that we'll ne never know and also never understand. Um, uh, for, for the people in the, in the, in the chat, Stan, Stan in particular, Stan is like, why are they talking? Zzz. 
Stan, if you're falling asleep, go to PokerGo.com right now. Watch all the high-stakes poker action w without us talking. It's very simple. This show is meant to be fun and funny and entertaining. If you have questions, please send them in. You cannot turn us off. We will keep talking. Ricardo says, this is actually a really good one. He says, I'm looking at a Bluff magazine with Christy on the cover as, once, as WPT, WPT wants to watch from 2015. Shout out to Jose Serrados who is also on the cover, and he's from my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. Well, guess what? I am also from Michigan, only a couple hours away from Detroit. Kalamazoo, if, I mean, of course, you know where that is if you're from Michigan. Kalamazoo, right in the middle. So, awesome. You have a copy of it? That's <laughs> cool. Who reads stuff in magazines anymore? That's I, awesome. I miss it. 2015. I mean, he, he must have found that at the bottom of the pile somewhere. That's five years ago. Um, but WPT wants to watch. Like, w was there a point in time in your career where you were close to, you know, becoming a regular on the tour, playing high stakes on the regular? Like, what's sort of the high point of your, of your personal playing life? Uh, the high point has definitely been this, the past year before the pandemic. I had been playing cash games primarily for a living, not huge, just just a mid stakes grinder, just a 510 no limit hold'em grinder. And I loved that life. But the past year, I'd started getting more into tournaments. I made a final table at Aussie Millions. And that trip really was completely me as a pro getting to play all of the Aussie Millions preliminary events all on my own. And it was so fun. And, um, you know, I got to bunk up with Lynn and Angel and me and Hel and Andrew walked to the streets of Melbourne grinding every day. And that's all we did. And that was really living the life, the glamorous life of going to another country one of the best cities in the world and getting to play and grind and just talk about poker every day. And that was like, that was in January of this year. So right before the pandemic started. And I think right now I'm going back to just being an amateur and, and playing poker maybe live every once in a while, but trying to make a living doing something else. Not sure what that is, but probably in the media since that's what I have all of my experience in and obviously writing the book. But uh, let, me, um, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second. Yeah. We got we got Ivy just let's watch. The, yeah, let's <laughs> watch this hand shitting on Helmies again. 90. Phil Helmies sound like a little kid. How much money you got today? 90. Also, Somebody at some point, I want to get your take on this. This around? Twitter battle. Yeah. I don't know. Have you already talked about it on this show? The Twitter battle about Phil Galfon talking about Ivy or I mean, Ivy excuse me, Phil Helmuth. Oh, 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 we, we can talk about that. Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. I love, I love talking about Phil Helmuth. Here's the king. King's on the turn for Ivy. Quick check. Phil Helmuth only has 80,000 left. There's already 60,000 in the pot. Helmuth knows Ivy was in the small blind, just called the 2,000, could easily have a hand like 7-8. He could check and see the river, or he can try and move Phil Ivy off his hand right here, go all in. I'm all in. He's going all in. Well, that's not going to work. It's interesting. One of the concepts that I think a lot of people who play, you know, lower stakes struggle with is they flop a hand like an open ended straight draw and a flush draw. And they just freak out. They're just like, I have so many outs. This is a hand I should semi bluff with but they don't ask themselves what hands am i actually trying to get my opponent to fold what hands do they have and do i have fold equity do i have enough to even make them fold or to price them out of their own possible draw and so that's because because you get so excited you just freak out so it's something to keep in mind here he goes looks like phil helmuth is leaving Oh my God! Did you guys did you guys see that? That was a great moment. Watch how Ivy just grabs Helmuth's cash like the brick. Just watch, watch this. This is really funny. Looks like Phil Helmuth is leaving. Yeah, I'll, I'll take, take that. that. I'll take that. <laughs> uh. 
Oh my God, that's amazing. See, I bet even, so because he doesn't have to grab it right then. Right. Right? Some people would be like, this is so awkward. I'm going to wait till he leaves because he's already packing up. He doesn't, he glances back, moves his shoulder <laughs> and just like scoops in that brick. That's mine now. See ya. That's basically mm -hmm. what he, what he was trying to say there. Um, and now I'm so bored. <laughs> Yeah, now I'm back to being bored again. I just want a bunch of money yeah. and now I'm back to being bored. Um, Marvin on Facebook is asking, Christy, what are three tips when you're the newbie at the table? Give, give, give Marvin some advice here. So I, we were uh, a couple, or Andrew and one of our best friends who's a poker player, we were watching TV and watching poker clips in movies. And we were thinking no matter how good the actor is, you can always tell that they're not poker players. And that when you're a newbie, it's a dead giveaway if you don't know how to touch and handle chips. So when it comes to table image, it really pays off if it takes a while for someone to know that you are the noob. So what I would say to people is if you can really try to work on all of those things too, that like can get you comfortable, get you comfortable, like touching chips, handling chips, peeling cards, mucking cards, don't bring a bank envelope to the poker table and open it and take your buy-in out, wrap your money up in a rubber band, you know, look like you've been there before and that won't put a target on your back. That's so, one tip. So what you're saying is I should not go to the ATM and buy in with all 20s? Do not. If you, <laughs> oh my gosh. And, People and tens, who are pros and will just salivate <laughs> and try to isolate you and three bet you and crush you. Don't do that. Uh, g g give us two more quick ones. Two more tips for Marvin. On, on two, more, two more quick ones. Play tight. Play tighter. Just play tight, top top cards, bet when you have good hands, and don't try to bluff people. That's the third tip. Like when you're playing low stakes and you're a noob, don't try to bluff people. Just bet for value. Make good hands and bet for value. That That's great advice even for someone who's experienced because – I'm usually um, like one and a half beverages in, and then my <laughs> my VPIP goes from from 17 to 37, um, because you just got to see some flops, and that's when you lose half your stack, and you're like, wait, I thought I I thought I had 400 dollars, and now I only have 200. Um, that's just really sad. Um, <laughs> all right, let's let's see what, what, what questions we got here. We got a lot of comments here. A lot of people commenting on how Helmut got owned, and yeah, he just booked it out of there right away. Um, he definitely did not really belong. Uh, in, in this lineup, sitting to the direct right of Phil Ivy, he probably realized that if I if I buy in again, I'm just gonna get crushed again by Phil because he's on my direct left. Totally. And also, another thing that Phil or another thing that happens when people have flush draws and straight draws, I already said they get like super excited. They don't even recognize if they have fold equity and just jam into hands that are going to call anyway when you can just call and see if you hit your draw the thing with phil is that he plays so tight if he actually had a good hand on a wet board like that he would have made some moves before the turn so he just i, I don't know i mean that's just something that people make a mistake with those hands often so i just wanted to point that out for the people in the chat that are wondering what are we watching and how can i watch the whole thing PokerGo.com. This is season six of High Stakes Poker. We have all seven seasons of High Stakes Poker available on PokerGo right now. And season eight is coming very, very soon. It's coming this year. So subscribe to PokerGo right now. Stay in touch with all the latest. And follow us on Twitter to hear the latest announcements on the new lineup for season eight, which is going to be amazing. Um, Seth Weintraub says, I cannot wait for the new season. Seth, I'm right there with you, man. I can't wait either. And it was really cool having you in the main event a couple years back. That was an awesome experience. Um, Timo, Timo Abrego is saying 400 viewers on Facebook, only 11 likes. Come on, people, give the show some love. Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Give, give the show some love. I, I appreciate it. Um, we are watching High Stakes Poker Season 6. We have a lot more action to come still. And we may or may not have some Gus Hansen versus Daniel Legrano action coming up because they are just, you know, perfectly situated there right next to each other, side by side, enjoying the action. Um, let's see if I missed any questions real quick. 
Um, oh, the same Timo Abrego says, Christy, can you share your biggest win in a tournament? When was it? How much did you win? And last but not least, was that the moment of your poker prime? My biggest tournament win was when I placed fifth in the WSOPC bicycle main event. Uh, it was for like 55,000. And I would say, I mean, yeah, that last year when I was playing more tournaments and it was really exciting making some final tables. Yeah, I would say that was definitely my prime. Came home with a backpack and a big fat, I have a picture of just like, oh, like I'm so sad. I got fifth, like boo hoo. I did all these things wrong. And then I opened my backpack and I was like, oh yeah, but here's a 50K brick. That feels pretty good. Oh, uh, what, what's the what's the silliest thing you did with that 50k? Or was it all smart investments? Uh well I I mean I don't buy frivolous things. I just spend money on things, experiences, people I love, like these like smaller things. I don't buy big things. It's weird. I mean, the most expensive piece of clothing or purse or shoe I own is like 200 bucks, which I think is pretty good for a girl. Yeah, my cycling shoes cost more than that. So yeah, you're doing really well. Uh, excuse me, I have a Peloton and I didn't even, I didn't even, can you see it? Oh yeah. I, I didn't even spend 200 bucks on, your bike probably costs a lot though. Is that how you lost all the weight? Is Are you cycling, are you a cycling maniac? Yeah, it is, it is. And I, and I always find the Peloton people really funny because there is an outside world and you can ride your bike in the sunshine. Yeah, but you get run over by cars. I'm still alive. So let's hope this continues. It's, I'm, I'm running, yes. pretty, running pretty well. Uh, Steve says, I love Christy's last vlog. Christy, I did not know you were in the vlogging streets. Are you, are you releasing vlogs all, all the time? I am not. I released uh, like a, sh like, I started a new YouTube channel, which is non-poker related, but it's like short films and videos about life and risk and love. And sometimes I do talk about poker and what it's taught me and how it applies to life and love. But my last video shared about how when I first started poker reporting, I was 21 and I was young and naive and was looking to the outside world to teach me who I'm supposed to be. And basically the poker forums told me and all the dudes in their basements typing on the internet told me I needed to be sexy. They basically were like, look at the girls in poker. Who's hottest? Who would I do? How would I rate them on a scale of one to 10 or the binary scale, which is do would I do them or not do them if given the chance as if most of those dudes would have any chance with any of the girls that they were posting in that forum. Um, but because of that, I I thought I was supposed to be sexy. So I, I found a guy to take sexy photos and dude, they were so cringe and I found them the other day. And I made a video about how looking back, I realized that it triggered eight years of social anxiety, which I really struggled with. And Evelyn Ng, who you guys know, like poker, you know, back in the day, she, she used to talk to me all the time about it. And she would really help because she struggled with social anxiety too. And I think it was often caused by the difference between who we really are and what the world wanted of us. So, um, so yeah, so I made a short film about it and I'm so happy that you liked it. So thank you so much, Steve. That's, that's really awesome. Do you, do you feel as though you had to sort of make that video to close the chapter in, in a way? I made it because I know that a lot of people struggle with social anxiety and in large part it's caused by misconceptions about who they think they're supposed to be whether someone uh, you know guys can relate to it i mean probably not specifically the part where they think that they need to be sexy but i think that they can relate to it in other ways and i think that anybody who has been bullied or worries about the world being a nice place and i'm sure you in some cases may deal with this because people say like you know they tell you how to be or what to do and i don't you know you've always been so outgoing. I don't know, like, does that ever make you doubt yourself or, or get nervous or, or about doing the right thing? The fun, the funny thing is, is that when I first started doing on camera stuff, that was like really, really awkward to me. And then when you start sort of living in front of the camera, 
you sort of become this personality, I guess, in a way where you turn it on and you turn it off. It's not like I'm, you know, going on to order my In-N-Out burger and I'm enunciating and being over the top excited when I'm ordering a burger, even though I'm very excited about it. But at the same time, having that on-camera persona in a way is sort of fun too because you get to sort of be more excitable and you get to be more, I don't know, in the moment almost versus when, because this is, this is my apartment. You can see my kitchen and my bike. I live in a very small apartment and I, you know, love living here. Half the time, I just sit on the couch and watch sports and don't say a word. So, you know, when you're on is, is when you're on camera. So when you meet people in the real world, sometimes they think that you're always on, but you know, that's, that's just not really how it works. But at the same time, I think it's, it's taught me a lot about, it's taught me a lot about life in a way without getting too deep of like, you know, being out there is, is sort of nice because you get to, first of all, you know, get people's responses. You get to joke around a little bit and you become more comfortable in your own skin. So I'm probably also the type of person that is just very comfortable in a way in a social setting. Like I'm like the social butterfly. Um, but it, it's helped me to be even more comfortable in a way being on camera all the time. Yeah. I mean, I definitely experienced that in you. You've always been really expressive with who you are. And it seemed even in social situations, really comfortable. Like you could talk to anybody, party with anybody and like get, and, and also you speak multiple languages, which I was always like, I remember being in lobby with you. I think maybe it was after the soccer game. No, it's probably too drunk. It's probably just another time, but you are just so comfortable. And I think that's amazing. And I think that like, you know, um, yeah, I just, I guess I just mostly, I made the video for people who do struggle with it because there are ways to move past it. And one of them being um, just confronting those judgmental voices, whether they be online or in our own heads. And, you know, you probably just have a really, really nice inner voice, which is like, that's really awesome. That's Or, or it's just very quiet in my head. And yeah, you know, just very easy that way. Um, let's see. Let's see if this hand goes anywhere. Hoivold with the fives trying to get aggressive here on Negrano and Ivy. Ivy has a set, so this can't go too well. Andre is going to make a move at the pot. I've never seen the guy with that. Daniel correctly doesn't believe that he has a big hand. So he calls here to probably try and take the pot away on the turn of the river. However... 20,000 from Phil Ivey and his three sixes. And that should be the end of this. This is one of those hands that just looks different than it does in 2020. When people, when people, um, that when they float, like Daniel's floating here, he's like calling Hoivold's bet because he's probably going to make a wanting to make a move on the turn or something like that. I mean, he does have like backdoor backdoor straight draw and a backdoor flush draw, but usually people just have much more immediate equity than his Jack 10 suited. And then also on such a, I mean, it's a pretty dry board on a King six, four, not everybody check raises with a set. Um, but it's just, it's just interesting that these hands just look so different, you know, and I don't, and I, I think these days, I don't, I don't know if Hoivold with these two, I mean, yeah, maybe with pocket fives, but it just, do you know what I mean? Like people just play so different. They're so much more aware of the number of combos they have. They don't do as much floating based on just what they feel, which Daniel back in the day and these days was known as the feel player. Like, I don't think you got it. I trust my instinct. I, just, I put, instead of putting you on ranges, he puts you on a specific hand. Like this is exactly the hand I think you have. So yeah, poker, different game. Definitely different game. But I do think Ivy made a mistake here because he has to be aware of the fact that Andreas Hoivold doesn't want to get bluffed by Phil Ivy on TV. And the best thing that can happen to Andreas Hoivold is bluffing Phil Ivy. So for Ivy to stick it in there on such a drive board with sixes, in this case where Hoivold has like a really good stack behind to bluff to turn with. I mean, Phil, I know you're watching. I know you're a big fan. You could have gotten his whole stack there because I think Andreas would have just pulled the trigger on the turn. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think it's doesn't Hoybold play like pretty snug most of the time here on high stakes poker. If right. I remember correctly. I mean, the funniest thing is the the biggest question is how did the how did he get in the game anyway? Like I I like Andreas. He's a really nice guy. I've interviewed him in the past, but he's a tournament regular. Like he yeah. he did not win the main event. The main event winners always got an invite. He was sort of like the most I guess unknown player to ever play on high stakes poker. I mean, we we knew him from the tournament circuit, but besides that, like he wasn't he wasn't a big superstar or anything. Well, the only thing that I can think of is really when a player like that who is playing so tight and on a king high board, and I think he was the preflop aggressor, that when, I mean, and I don't know how deep they were, so maybe, you know, you're right, he should just call. But when you're, when you're deep and a tight player on a board that is better for him or he has the advantage and he C bets into two players, you might want to just check raise and start getting the money in because he likely has just a really good hand, like ace king or king queen or something like that. And and you want to just kind of start piling in the money and they're probably not going to fold the top of the range when they're super tight. So I don't know. That's maybe what he was possibly thinking. Question coming in from Daniel Arlison, one of our regular watch uh, viewers on the show. He says, I remember Christie's epic reaction to the Sean Deep slow roll against Matisau. How bad was the tension during that episode of Poker Night in America? You guys have... No idea. You think it was awkward watching on show, but we are actually sitting at a poker table and it is silent. There's no music. There's no commentators. I'm sitting next to a human, Mike Matisau, who is already an edgy kind of person and he's having a meltdown and he's sitting right next to me. Dude, it is so much more intense and awkward than you can ever see on a TV show when you're actually sitting right there and there's zero editing. <laughs> Mike Matisau is, he, I think he has a great heart. I think that he genuinely cares about people and is loyal to those that he cares about. But I also think that he has He's unstable in some ways. I think that he has a, I mean, I know he has a fanny pack full of the things that, he, you know, he, he takes it. I mean, he talks about this regularly. Uh, and he was just very un unstable at that, in those moments. Right. I mean, I, I can't imagine. Um, um, let, let us know in the comments your opinion on slow rolling. Have you slow rolled? Do you f slow roll, roll your friends or do you slow roll the drunk guy at the table who's being obnoxious? Give us some slow roll stories because personally, I have been slow rolled mostly by people that I know in some silly mix games, but I've never really pulled a good one off. So give me some stories. Maybe give me some tips on how to slow roll a little bit. Um, Robert is saying Gabe Kaplan for president. I think Gabe Kaplan would make a great president, to be honest. Gabe Kaplan is kind of a legend. And I hope we hear much more from him in the future. Let's just let's just say that. Ooh, wait, is that foreshadowing? Uh, well, I, I didn't say anything. Uh, well, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. We gotta wait and see. You gotta subscribe to Poker Go and catch up on all the episodes before the new ones come out because exactly. you gotta you gotta just you're not a real poker fan if you haven't seen every single episode of high stakes poker at least twice uh, yes <laughs> and and i don't i would never slow roll slow roll i just it just takes too much time right matthew says i slow roll all the time every time it spices up the game it does it depends on if you have to meet those people for dinner later or if they're just strangers. That's probably a big difference maker. I can't say that. Don't Wait, the bet's actions. over. No, it's not. Oh, okay, never mind then. It's never over. <laughs> they're talking about bets. You know, when I was on Poker Night in America, I really saw how, I mean, you know, they talk about side bets all the time here on High Stakes Poker. But really, when you're around some of these guys, it is nonstop. When I flew on a private jet from Vegas to New York for high, for uh, Poker Night in America, every time Mike Matisseau or Greg Mueller saw a flat surface, they were dealing hands of Chinese. It's insane. That's that's crazy. What's your favorite kind of like friendly gambling? Are you a casino gambler or Chinese poker? Like what do you what do you do? 
Uh, my favorite is just how much will you do this for? Oh yeah. How much would it <laughs> take for you to do this? Weren't, weren't, weren't we together when we paid somebody $200 to eat a cockroach? I was not weren't there, we? it was, but I wish uh, I was. Donnie, well, Donnie was there and it was like a bunch of us poker players and we were just joking around like, cause there was a giant cockroaches walking around the parking lot. And we're just like, how much would it cost? Oh. 200 bucks. But oh. a guy walking by, I mean, we're talking poker players here. So 200 is like, <laughs> and a guy walks by and he's like, I'll do it for 200 bucks. And before we could say anything, he picked up the cockroach and put it in his mouth and ate it. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like, we're kind of like, oh, well, you, we didn't say like bet before, but I mean, he just ate a cockroach. We just gave him some money. It was pretty gross. Oh my God. This is, that's one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. Um, I remember the time we told Donnie not to climb a tree and he did and he fell out of the tree and he was covered in scratches after a night of Balboa's, which, you know, it's just par for the course, I guess. Um, I'm trying to remember the night that we went out in Madrid and went to the Real Madrid game and you, you ended up upside down almost. You, I, I could have literally ruined all your teeth forever. You could have. <laughs> you could have ruined my poker news <laughs> career but you were very sturdy if i remember correctly all those pictures i was just see here's the thing not only do i play poker in a tight aggressive manner i also party in a tight aggressive manner <laughs> i don't do it often but when i do i'm gonna go for it it's yeah. just how it is that, that's how that's how it should be. I'm the same. All right, we got a, we got Tom Juan involved. Hoyvold with the ace queen. Look at look at Ivy. Ivy's like, I want to play against Tom Juan so bad, and he just doesn't want to fold. Yeah, as he yawns too. Yes. I mean. Hoyvold must be thinking right now, I have ace queen off. This is the nuts against Tom Duan, who could have 7 6 offsuit. Who's also on the button. <laughs> yes. Last time I saw a hairstyle like Andreas was when Dennis the Menace took mushrooms. How much are you playing? Like 70 more? That could be the yeah, mushroom. Yeah, 80, 80, 80, 80 something. I almost said. Sandra, you got like 160 or something. Three players for the plot. I'm too embarrassed. Um, Duan wanted to know how much of this. I, in, in this spot, obviously not when I'm playing for 70K and I've never played these stakes before, so I'm not saying I know what it's like, but when an aggressive, loose player like Tom Dwan or any kind of maniac three bet squeezes on the button and I have ace queen O with this stack to pot ratio, I'm jamming like every time, right. every time. So it's interesting because now you're in a spot where when you call, you're pricing in the player behind you a ton. Now you're going to have to play ace, queen, O out of position to two really good aggressive players. There's just not a lot of flops where you're going to be jacked about it. It's just going to suck. So I'd either jam or fold. Yeah, I also think that ace queen is not the type of uh, see a flop kind of hand when you're out of position in this kind of way even even when the stacks are deeper it's not the easiest hand to play especially given the fact that you're going to be three-handed uh, or three ways and given the fact that you're out of position against tom one so tough spot i think shove shove or fold folding isn't even that bad co compared to calling probably yeah the deeper you are actually the more you want to fold because the less because when you have a smaller stack pot ratio you can you can just stack off with top pair more often. But when you have no no flush possibilities, it's like, yeah, you definitely want to fold some more. Yeah. Uh, please keep those questions coming in the chat. Not a lot of slow rollers here. So I think we're dealing with a pretty nice crowd here today. Um, there, Daniel does tell a story about slow rolling, which is funny. Um, someone from the Ukraine says you, sh you should get Norm MacDonald for season seven. Norm MacDonald actually does the commentary for season seven, and we'll probably watch some of that here on Run It Back. So subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned. This show happens twice a week, Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern and every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, question coming in from, let me get the name as well, Tom Marlowe. He says, Christy, what's the biggest cash pot you've ever played? Biggest cash pot I've ever played. Oh man, that's a that's a tough one. It's got to be somewhere around like 25k. Um, man, there's been a few that have 
been around the 20, 25K mark. And one of them being, <laughs> so when I played Poker Night in America, premiere episode, they added me in last minute. I had just quit my job at Poker News to play professionally. There were lights, cameras, and they chose me to fly on this private jet with all the pros and play this cash game, which was 2550 cash game. I, at the time I had been playing mostly two five and five ten, So this was, you know, 10 times bigger than anything I'd ever played. So I sold some action to my friends and it was like this poker group of friends that we had a chat and like, we always talked about poker. So they're sweating with me. This is like right when live stream, I mean, live streaming wasn't even a huge thing when this started, it was like 2014 or whatever. And, um, I'm super nervous. First time playing these stakes, first time really playing as a pro on camera, all this pressure. What are people going to think? My friends have a piece of me. I buy in for 5k. So it's 25.50 and everybody is straddling. So I'm like, oh, okay. So it's going to be playing bigger. Third shuffle, Remco. Third shuffle. And I'm in uh, the small blind and no, I'm in the big blind and Mike Madison is in the, in the straddle and I have pocket coins. I raise, he three bets, I four bets, he jams, I call. And that was the first like pot over 10K I ever played. And it was just a flip. And I was like, oh, this is what it's like where you just, you just go like, you just flip a coin for, for uh, five figures. And I lost that shuffle, rebought. Um, and I think in that game, I probably played a 25 or 20K pot. Uh, and uh, when I lived in the Bay Area, there was 20 like a 10 25 game where I played some big pots. And I think I played a couple big pots on live with the bike around that if I can remember correctly, but, um, but the 10 K pot with Mike Madison was probably the most memorable. It's the only one I can really remember to regale you with. In this hand, we have Ivy and Mineri, both with the classic six, three suited. However, classic six, three suited. <laughs> Mineri has the pair with it. Here's what I think of your ace jack. Oh, yeah, yeah, when it goes. Queens versus 55. Ivy falls. Dario thinks he was semi bluffing, didn't realize he was free rolling. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I, look at look at him, look at him. Ivy's like, this kid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you. <laughs> this kid. This kid. Come over to my house for a few beers sometime. Just don't tell anyone where you're going. <laughs> do you know? Do you know what the action was pre? No, I, I missed it. I, I was I was too busy listening to your Mad's House story. Um, but the beauty of this is <laughs> is that all seven seasons are available on Poker Go. So if you like me were not was not paying attention, then go check that out. This is season six. We're in episode two. Um, next week we're gonna keep watching season six. So if you enjoy the action, stay tuned for more. We're gonna keep doing. Oh, Kings. Kings. Kings for Dwan. Are talking about is it really fair no. when someone like Tom Dwan gets a pocket Kings? I mean, as if fair existed in poker, but really, it's, it's, just, it's not fair at all. It's not fair, especially when you got a good hand, but so far nobody has one. All right, Holy Vold, what you going to do? Yeah, with your fours. Remember when when poker... We were so excited about poker. We just called hands, every, like nicknames all the time. We we're like, oh, I got sailboats. Oh, yeah. Hockey sticks or um, cowboys. The uh, the Anna Kornikova. It looks good, but it's actually not that great. <laughs> just, that was the meanest one. That was the meanest one. Ace King. Oh, no, there's meaner ones. Oh, there are. Yeah, there's meaner ones, but we're not gonna we're not gonna say this because we're not mean anymore. But right let, back let, in the day, let let us know in the chat though. What's your favorite poker hand nickname? I think Snowman is still my favorite. Oh, how good do you feel when you raise the pocket kings? Obviously, an ace comes. Everybody says, and then you check, and the king just hits the turn. And you're like, oh, hello. <laughs> and and he's just like, come on, Andreas, throw one chip in the pot, please. Just one, at least. Straight. You know what I mean? It's like a specific situation where you would like. Uh, would it doesn't look like Dura is going to check this time. Probably hoping that Dolly Parton uh, nine to five. That's a good one. Oh, Dolly Parton, yes. 
That's a great Dan one, Daniel Ar Arluson. Good one. King Kong. What's that? King is just thinking about this. Oh. His five old five me a pair of fours. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. But he knows <laughs> That's I I had never heard that before. <laughs> is he gonna call really? Yeah, what is happening? turns over nothing. Oh, I would have And he says He's like, I wanna look cool. So I, I wanna call just to get just, I don't know, it's kind of bad maybe i don't know yeah that's just another case of 2020 being different than back then because hoyvold just was like i don't know but you know what i don't think you got it and that was it that was the end of the hand reading i don't think you got it <laughs> exactly and i call but really you know 2020 you're like what are his you know what's the range of hands he has and how many of those hands that he chooses as one of his best bluffs is not going to have force beat and they're not many because actually <laughs> we know that it's good to bluff with blockers any blockers obviously to you know big hands and he just was, would have a pair then <laughs> come on man seth weintraub is saying motown jack jack five that that's a good one. You never just you never get to play Jack Five, which kind of is kind of a bummer. Um, Jack Four flat tire. I've never heard that one before. Um, let's see. King, oh, this is a funny one. Blank on the river says King Nine, the lumberjack hand. Keep playing King Nine, and you'll be back working as a lumberjack. It's it's actually really good. I love that. I appreciate that. That's a great one. Um, Tom. That is pretty good. Tom Marlow on Facebook says, "Have you ever played against Phil Helmuth?" And ha have you ever had him blow up on you? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand a little bit. Um, do you have a Phil Helmuth story in general in case you have not played against him? Uh, well, I had known him for since the beginning of my career, which I started in 2006, which was 14 years ago. And I interviewed him many times. And I still think he has. And I've partied with him. I've, I still, every time I see him, I'm like, hey, Phil. He, he, he just looks at me and he's like, Blank stare every time. Oh. He has no idea who I am. That's my only Phil Helmuth story. That's so, so true. Um, I have a really quick, really quick, funny Helmuth moment. He busts a tournament, but he had already promised to talk to me for an article. So then he, oh no, sorry, no. He bags up chips. So he, the day is over. So, so you know, at the Rio, you have the back hallways and then the, the big time pros park their cars like right outside in the back. So, so Phil goes, come on, kid, walk with me. So I got my, I got my phone out to get quotes and he's like, He's like six foot six and his, his pace is pretty high down the hallway. So I'm like running after him, holding up the microphone and he's talking and talking and talking. It's like a nine, seven, nine minute monologue. And then he gets into his car, shuts the door and drives off. Like as he ends his sentence, just like the, the strangest moment ever. Like I thought it was hysterical. It was also like three in the morning or something. It was really funny. Um, let's see. Uh, deuces are ducks. Threes are crabs. Fours are sailboats. I like this. I like all these um, all these hands. Oh, wait. Ducks. I love ducks. Oh, yeah. This is a big hand here. Yep. Daniel Nograno with, he was the first one who made us all fall in love with suited connectors. <laughs> Everybody was like, Daniel Nograno says, small ball, play with suit connectors. And I love that Gus Hansen just calls right behind him because he has Dwan, who is a squeezy McGee. Yep. And then Minieri just four bets. decision for Gus. Wow. He thought he was slow playing his hand against Daniel. And Juan re-raised. I mean, I think this is kind of what Gus wants. The, the two most aggressive players trying to beat up on him. Yeah. And is Minieri, is he on the button? Uh, let's see when we pan Gus back said, to him. I was trapping here. What happened? 55, 55, the speed limit. Another good one. Mm -hmm. Fish hooks. Gus down ace -king. Wow, Gus, what are you doing, man? However, next to him, we have a man with king five. <laughs> I started down with yeah, button for Manieri. Yeah, that's, that's tough. And I don't think this man's going to lay this hand down. He might even raise. You never know what he's going to do. Most players wouldn't even be in the hand. Wouldn't have called the 3,000 with king five suited. He raised, and now he's going to call a re-raise. 
Oh, uh, yes. 22,300 yes. more with King 5 suited. Now, in the past, things like this have worked out for Tom Dwan because he's outplayed people or outflopped them. Let's see what happens here. Andrew and I talk about spots like this where maybe you three bet or you four bet a player and they just call you out of position or something with a shit hand. And you're just like, we're just like, this is just straight up disrespect. <laughs> like, yes, Duan is basically like, I don't respect you as a player. And I'm just going to, I'm playing this hand. I mean, okay, Dwan folds quickly to a bet of almost 40K. If there was even one spade on the board, I think Dwan would have considered it. Dwan to have a queen. Like if he had King Likely. What, ha, does Minieri still play poker? Um, last I heard of him, he was playing l relatively low stakes back home. So hope he's hope he's making it back to the top one day. I, I don't have any idea. I haven't seen him at the high stakes for a long time. Mm, interesting. Let's see. We got we got a lot of, we got a lot of good poker poker and hand names. I I love this. This is this is a great idea. Oh, there's there's the fake aces. Yes, fake His aces. Has it. Gus has the fours now. Sailboats. Yep. And oh, the Ninas nine. That's cute. That is that is cute. Um, do do you think you've left poker behind hey, as a Jack player for Ryan for good? Like, do you think it's 7, just over? No, I will never stop playing poker for now when the pandemic started and live poker rooms shut down. The only place to play obviously is online. And at the beginning of the pandemic, Andrew and I had a conversation as a couple and we were like, okay, what are we going to do? Cause he's a live player. Also, we were just regularly playing at commerce and the bike in Hawaiian gardens. Like, what are we going to do? And I started playing online a little bit and I was miserable. And I know that, yes, I mean, it's still poker, but I was just really unhappy. And I think that there had been other things that I've been wanting to do, like write this book. And so we talked about it and he was just like, I'm going to play. So he, he really buckled down, had to relearn really how to approach poker because online poker is a different set of skills and assets and you have to be, you know, you know, he, he did the work, got in the lab and did that. And I started writing and producing content and yep. I've been really happy doing that. I know live poker is coming back and I know that taking this time off will have me fall behind where I'm currently at, but I know that it will be there when I want to come back. I think that there's only one great time for me to write this book and we're trying to start a family. So we're going to do that. But poker will always be one of my great loves. Sometimes it does feel like a toxic relationship, but you know, it will, I'll always, I will always love them or love poker. So I'll be, I'll be back for sure. And I see somebody asking in the chat, do you think poker will, you know, poker tournaments will come back in 2021 and you know, right now the cash games actually with the plexiglass, if people, if, if rooms can duplicate this on a larger scale that will allow for tournaments, the plexiglass, the masks, I think that tournaments will return in 2021. I, I think it's possible. Yeah. And I mean, I want nothing more than the 2021 WSOP. That'd be amazing. I do think that smaller events, higher stakes are easier to organize because it's easier to, to check everyone and to have all that stuff go down safely. So I'd be willing to say that the, the chances of a super high roller bowl happening are much higher than the WSP mm. main event with 8,000 players. So it sort of speaks for itself, but it's also sort of, you know, it gives me hope to think that we might see the super high roller bowl early 2021. I would just hope, I would love to see that. That'd be amazing. Um, yeah, it, I just, I, I just so. miss, I miss live tournaments. I'm a tournament guy. You know, I love cash games, but I'm a tournament guy. WSOP was always my first love as far as what I first watched. So it, it just, it has to come back. It has to come back soon. Um, Robert is asking who takes it down for a heads up match between you and your husband. <laughs> uh, it's funny, actually on our very first date when I was 19, we played heads up in his living room. Yes, I went home with him the first night. Did I give it up? No, but I played heads up poker and we played with change until the sun came up. 
I won then. And that was probably the last time I won heads up against him because he he's really good. And people are always like, oh, you must be good because you're because uh, some dude or your husband taught you. And I'm like, whatever. Yeah, I am. So what? It's true. He's really good. Honestly. Right. I mean, that's what she said. <laughs> we got more Tom Dwan action with Phil Ivy involved. Let's see if we can get a little creative here. Just gonna call. I need carbs. I, I just don't get it. I'm trying to get a six pack. I want to get a six pack. I want to be good then. Three I clubs. I need more carbs than anyone I ever know. Well, you're just Beside the pair of fours, Daniel's got the ace of clubs. That's what they say. Dwan's got the jack. <laughs> Cut. Oh, you gotta give me a pound on that one. That was good. That was, that was good. <laughs> it wasn't as good as the Superman one in the room like five years ago, but it was good. You remember that one? I love how Ivy has the worst hand by a Ivy big margin, and he's just firing. Yeah, but he turned a gutter ball, you know? Yeah. Got to realize that equity. <laughs> I got to say, poker players and their style, their personal dress has come a long way since this time. Are you referring to the uh, em embroidered Esfandiari button-up shirt? I'm referring mostly to does Gus's collar, Daniel's sweater. Daniel brings it with the style lately. I mean, Tom Dwan really turned the, um, I guess, the zip up into into something special. Whenever I see someone with a zip up without without the hoodie, I'm like, oh, it's a Tom Dwan, Tom Dwan, Tom Dwan ah. sweater. Yeah. Or when you it's when like you, a hoodie, what, a little more dressed up. When you're wearing a, a like a single color baggy shiny dress shirt oh it's phil ivy 100 <laughs> percent. baggy too it's got to be like just a size too big yep ivy's giving up here on the river i wonder if dan's gonna check was it yeah. he checks surprise me that's the ivy was it effect. on high stakes poker when Oh, yes. What was the hand where Patrick Antonius and Sam Farha got in some massive hand and they got all in and one of them was like, I have a very weak hand. And the other, and the other was like, no, I have a weak hand. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's, that's season four, High Stakes Poker, uh, Jack Nine against King Queen. And the funniest quote from that that whole thing is is that there's I think there's two hearts or two diamonds it's a, it's a red flop there's there's a flush draw out there they get all in in the matter of seconds for a million dollars and Farha looks over at and Tony goes you flushing you flushing I'm like it, yeah. there's a there's a million dollars in there do you, do you have a flush draw like and and I think um, and Tony says Jack Nine is, is against King Queen so it's uh, two over cards with the flush draw against uh top pair jack nine just, yeah, just and they're like do you have a pair and then yeah. the other one's like do you have a pair <laughs> you have you got a set and then he's like no and the, and the funniest is is the the negotiating that goes on before they turn their cards oh, yeah. over and then doyle doyle made some snarky comment because it took too long it's just mm -hmm. amazing like when you're 80 when you're 82 years old you have no time no time to waste you don't have time yeah it's so true but i also appreciate that High stakes poker was shot and filmed and really just allowed players to be who they are and have always been, which is making these side bets, like negotiating. And I know that it inspires others, you know, maybe like some one, two and two, five players to want to like run it three times and do all this. But, um, you know, when you're playing for these amounts of this amount of money, it's you sh you know you should be able to do that right it, it's, it's very true for the people who don't know this hand and i can tell that the chat knows the hand that we're talking about if you don't know the hand there's a playlist on our youtube channel and also on facebook that has this hand so go find it if you if you haven't seen this antonius uh, far hands it's, it's amazing it's it's terrific elezer with the aces here he's got this one locked down Ellie's gonna pick this moment to bet doesn't have a lot to get called so by however says, what are you betting now for Oh, I love the leather Ellie jacket. Says a waste of three aces. Ellie had a waste. class. Damn, 
he has always been such a great, amazing, nice human. Yeah, definitely. That's right. Don't say I've been quiet, Antonio. You've been quiet. Push play tight. <laughs> Ivy's looking at Andreas Hoivolt's money like, that's actually my money. You're just sitting in front of it, but it's kind of my money. <laughs> I... This was was this during the time too when you could also play with cash on the table at places like Aria and the Win. Yeah, hundred percent. Because I remember playing with cash, a single hundred dollar bill behind my stack. Oh, oh, you would buy in for one hundred behind. You're like, give me two, three racks of red or whatever, and then put the one yes. bill because it looked cool. Hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. That was awesome. And then we just stack them behind. And then someone asked you, how many bills is that? And I'm like, one. <laughs> oh man good old times yeah i think it ended i remember hearing at the bellagio someone had a stack of bills like a you know in a wrap or whatever behind and someone went all in and they shipped the pot and they thought it was like a stack of 5k with a band but inside were ones and they were like they let me or whatever wow. then they didn't do that anymore that's crazy that's an angle Seven, seven, queen. That's nuts. Two hearts. Ten million people watching a football game. I didn't even know about it. And it's a girl. Cool. And they're full cool of peeps, and they're not going to leave their chair. Yeah, I mean, there's like games all. You know, they're they're watching it somewhere. Ellie calls a forty-five hundred with his queens. If you're watching, you get a password, and then you've been playing a free roll online for twenty thousand. Michael says, "Love from Austria." Michael, shouldn't you be in bed by now? It's like the middle of the night over over there. And uh, that said, where is everyone watching from? I'm very curious to hear where everyone is from. Minieri keeps betting. I'm sure Elezra is going to keep calling. Ellie looks at Daniel and says, check it. This is one of those places where my coach would be like, why? Yeah. Why are you betting? Oh. Oh, because <laughs> that's why. <laughs> he checks. Oh, my God. Well, Dario was convinced that Ellie had a queen. He thought he could check his full house and trap Ellie, but Ellie would not get trapped. Sorry, Dario. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's so crazy to think about these hands and understand ranges and why you bet or why you check and know that who I am as a player now is better than Dario Minieri at this moment in time. Yes. Back in high stakes poker when he was playing for this amount of money. Like that's that's a cool thought. Yeah, and, and I've played this mind game with myself. Um, like how many years do I have to go back in time to be the best player in the world? Yeah. With, with my current with well, my current skill. Dude, that's a great game. I think people in the chat should think about that. I agree, actually. That's a great what question. Year, what year do you have to go all the way back to, and you would be the best player in the world? For me, it's probably 1968. <laughs> yeah. Right before the WSOP became a thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, Stu, maybe Stu Unger, though, could still just read your soul, no matter what you did. Right. It's but, possible. But I, but I know to full deuces to a three bet. So that's an edge. <laughs> Let's see where this hand goes. Even though there's been a lot of action on these first two shows, people have not been calling this kind of money with hands like this. But Ellie's back in town. This is good enough for him to call 12-2. I was going to say, you can't take your 3300 back. <laughs> Three diamonds on the flop. Antonio threw away two diamonds. Look at that graphic. It's not that often that you'll see deuces that big a favorite over two other hands. But Gus is 75% favorite in this hand right now over both those hands. Something Gabe said that was interesting is that this is one of the first pots that some of the players are getting a little bit more loose, playing or you know, calling bigger bets. And it's something for people in the chat who are watching, who are maybe they're beginning players or something that a lot of beginning players don't think about is how game flow works. It's like, it's like a rubber band. 
sometimes the game gets very loose and there's a number of factors that that happen maybe like a player change or stacks are just deeper now and you really have to pay attention to those things because it changes the range of hands that you play it changes whether you call or you three bet um and so you just like want to ask yourself like how's that rubber band feeling right now in the game especially people who tend to be more analytical, they forget to ask themselves these environmental questions and emotional questions. And you can also think of yourself as a human, as like a, a rubber band. Like, are you, are you, how are people seeing you? Are you super tight? Are you super loose? It's just, these questions are important to ask yourself, especially if you aren't doing that naturally, if you're not just like one of those natural people, because poker players tend to be more analytical. They think about patterns, numbers, math, and these other indicators and variables are very important too. Sean Kiesling on YouTube is saying there were rumors, which I've never heard, that they weren't actually playing for the real amount of money on high stakes poker. Well, that's not true because I know who made the show, Mori Eskandani, and I know a lot of these players and I've talked to them many, many times. And yes, Negreanu lost millions of dollars of his actual real money playing on high stakes poker. And yes, it was all real. It was all their own money. They got paid to play on the show but it had nothing to do with the fact that these people were playing with their own money. And also, they were not getting paid enough to lose a million dollars, just to make that clear as well. So yeah, this was actually a really, really real game. Um, lots of people chiming in from all over the world. We have, um, we have Kentucky, Finland, India, Seattle, Charlotte, Austin, England, Rio, lots of Canada, Puerto Rico, um, Miami, yeah, my I should turn my light my light on too. It's so dark over here. Um, yeah, <laughs> Chris and I are in, are in the same time zone. You can tell the sun just went down here on the west coast. Um, and then people chiming in. By the way, let's let me check Facebook real quick. We got more more Canada, Texas, UK, uh, Poland, Idaho. That's great. Lots of people coming in from all over the world, and some people referencing. Um, when they were uh, when, when they would be the best player in the world. The the latest year I've seen is 2003. I've seen lots of 1991 the year 1492 that's that's probably that's probably true for most people um 8, <laughs> 1887 and 1967 i love it let's see where this hand goes it's Hanson bets 11k tom Luan calls with the queen but Hanson like has two pair But he thinks better of it. Thinks somebody might have a higher flush draw. Oh. And Andreas oh. makes his move. Hello. Thinks he might have the best hand and wants to end it right here. I'm not folding. <laughs> <laughs> he's. He, I'm sorry, but he's playing like a tournament. Yeah. I meet myself with nothing. Gus puts on his Popeye face. What's going on here? Well, I never seen anything like this in my life. That comes over here from Norway, another Scandinavian. <laughs> this is actually a tough spot, I think. Is, is it because Dwan is still behind him? Well, oh, oh, wait. Oh, he went all in. Um, yeah, that certainly is, but uh, Koivold just playing so tight. they allow us to deal twice or no? Okay. You want to deal it twice? Okay. All right. <laughs> Remember what card. season? What season was? Oh, Chris's picture froze. Guy Let's... La Liberté was like, this is. Oh, oh you're, you're back. You see me? You're back. Yeah, say that again. What season was it? Because you know they're talking about running it twice or not, and it's like this is this is kind of like a meta game thing too. Like if people don't know, you run it only once or twice like it changes how people play but remember what was it what season was it when Gila Liberté went all in with somebody and someone was like hey do you want to run it twice and he's like hey it's up to you this is like your life this is almost nothing to me do you remember that yes that was against David Benjamin and I, oh, I, yeah. I, I want to say it was season maybe season four I can't recall exactly what season it was but four or five or six one of those but yeah a very iconic moment where Guy basically says you know to me this is like 
you know, pocket changed for you. This is like whatever the end of it, which is, I thought it was so boss, but also very generous to say like, you know, whatever you want to do, because I'm like, okay, with whatever. Right. Well, in this case, case money for Andreas Heuvold, he's out of here. He's gone. So we won't be seeing him again on the next episode. Um, this, however, brings us to the end of, oh my God, the gangster himself. The, fl- uh, the uh, <laughs> This look, Christy, like, is he selling weed? Is he selling weed at the same time? What's going on here? Uh, man, talk about Booger style, Jason Mercier. Wow. This is incredible. The back. Look at him go. Look at look at Phil Ivey's face. Look at both Phil Ivey and Daniel. Like, are are you seeing this kid? This is this is incredible. <laughs> this is this is simply incredible. All right, as you can see on the screen, next time on Running Back, we'll watch this episode. It's going to be Jason Mercer getting spoiler alert his ass kicked by Phil Phil Ivey because I already know that's going to happen. Um, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. We're going to have more shows next week, two shows twice a week, Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss it. Join me once again. If you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, chime in in the chat. I'm trying to take all the questions that I can take every single time. I appreciate all you guys watching and still watching. I see Robert. I see, I see Alex. I see Jin. I see, uh, Bren R and Patrick and, Bradley and oh Mitchell is always there Mitchell you'll get your studio tour one day we'll we'll get to that we have Randy we have Francis and Steven and George so many people watching I really really appreciate it Christy one more time how can people follow you and and where should they follow you and 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 what's happening with you in the next few months uh I'm always I'm always posting on Instagram christy.arnett and you can find all the links there I mean always on Twitter hanging out with you you're posting very important things like what are the best snacks? So like that was my favorite thread ever to follow. But yeah, christyarnett.com. Thanks so much for hanging out, you guys. It was really, really, really fun. Appreciate you, Robert, Alex, Kevin, all of you guys. Thank you. That was it for today. So next week I am back with season six, High Stakes Poker, Jason Mercer with the backwards cap and the half see-through sunglasses, the Christian Odege shirt and whatever that button, that whatever that zip up is. And uh, lots of Phil Ivey stare downs. For now, her name is Chris Yarnett. My name is Ram Karinkama. This was Runner Back. Thank you for watching. Have a good weekend.